So, welcome, Christina. I am so happy to have you. So, on today's episode, we are number three of Let's Figure It Out. I interview my favorite people and what they do best the health, the mindset, and lifestyle of women who want more for themselves and their family and who are committed to just figuring it the heck out. So today I've got my friend, fellow naturopathic doctor, Dr. Christina DeCroon, who uh, in the last couple of months has gracefully helped me transition into maternity leave and is looking after some of my patients while I'm off with this sweet creature who we hope stays napping. And she maintains a practice in Ingersoll, Ontario. Um, and what I love about you, Christina, you come from a very strong rural background, much like myself, where sometimes the pace is a little bit different, but we understand um, that there's beauty in the slowness of life and intentionally building out a community around yourself. Um, and right now we are talking about birth, babes, and beyond because you and I, well, you are very much pregnant. You're entering the very yeah. pregnant stage and yeah. I am postpartum with a 14 year week old baby girl at a time in our life where what we want is community, where we are looking forward to rituals with our family and our friends and sharing that. And in our current climate, that has changed very much. So I'm so looking forward to chatting with you about how you and I are both navigating this um, with grace, um, with sanity, so that we can continue to thrive and support our families. And for any of you that are joining live on Zoom or on Facebook or later on our replays, please do ask any questions um, in our chat boxes respectively. We are happy to take live questions. So welcome, Christina. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this. <laughs> My pleasure. So um, when I got in touch with you to set up this time to chat, some of the things that were going through my mind are like, oh my goodness, um, I'm newly postpartum. I've got a brand new baby girl and we have all these ideas of what this uh, period of time should look like. And my first thought was terribly, thank goodness I've had my baby already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so many of our patients that you and I share and um, a number of my friends, and I'm sure a number in your circle too, there's lots of women that are about to give birth or have just given birth um, with midwives and OBs that are wearing personal protective gear. Mm -hmm. So I would love to talk about some of the things that are working um, for you, some of the things that you and I are both doing or uh, your wisdom so we can handle this whole period well. Yeah. So, so maybe tell us a little bit about um, you, a little bit about your background, about how you are doing through all of this right now. Yeah, it's been a big shift. So I'm 32 weeks tomorrow, um, and this is our first baby. We've, um, we're very excited. We waited a long time for this baby to come, and uh, the past couple of months have really shifted my idea of what um, birthing would look like and um, especially having our firstborn into a pandemic season not the most ideal but um, I think a lot of it a lot of the stress comes from the uncertainty and the everything that changes so quickly around guidelines around what we can and cannot do um, so I really try from a mindset perspective to just focus on what I can control. So I can control what I'm saying to myself and my self-talk. I can control, you know, my self-care routines, my sleep routine, um, when I'm eating. Um, and all that kind of plays into just making sure that I'm heading into this uncertain period um, with the right mindset and a mindset that is serving where I want to go. That's a big one for me is just really focusing on my mental health, which is difficult during this period um, when ideas and dreams are um, forced to be changed. And changing every single day. I know. Yeah, it's crazy. So um, in terms of self-care, I had a really great interview uh, earlier this week with Fallon Martin, who we both know, who's a birth doula in the community, um, who helps women through all these transitions. She uh, mentioned some really great at-home self-care techniques, but I'm curious about what is working for you right now in terms of establishing 
a ritual given that you and I are both working from home and a lot of people are working from home for maybe the first time in their life while navigating some pretty significant physiological changes. Yeah, working from home is a big shift too, right? To not have a physical location to leave the house and go to. So that was um, that was difficult at the start. And I think in terms of just setting boundaries for myself and my practice and knowing, you know, these are the hours that I'm working, these are the hours that I'm not working. And I very, very conscious, and oh gosh, I am... Um, I'm very much aware of my office space and I only do office work in my office space. And at the end of the day, I leave that door and I shut it and I leave my office and hopefully leave um, what I can from a work perspective um, at the office and I return to it when I'm ready to. So I think creating boundaries around um, your at-home office and what that looks like for you is really important just so that you're not always carrying work around with you when you're off. So mm -hmm. it's and that yeah. can be particularly challenging because we all have access to all of our work emails yeah. from our phone. And I've had to tell myself, you know, it's 10 o'clock. I do not need to answer this email right now. It can wait until like a normal business hour. Um, and I feel like most people are pretty forgiving right now, given that we are all at home, probably wearing pajamas right now, at least from our pants down. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> that we're all navigating this weird new normal together. Um, so you had mentioned and shared with me that the pregnancy insomnia has been ramping itself up. And I, <laughs> I remember like from the moment that I got pregnant, suddenly my sleep shifted. And of course now it's, it's variable to a moving target. Um, tell me what you're doing right now to protect your sleep in the meantime, given that everything is different than it was three months ago. Yeah, insomnia is an old friend of mine. Um, so to have it back in my life in third trimester, I'm not overly surprised. But I think when it comes to insomnia, just really recognizing that, you know, pregnancy related um, fatigue is also really, um, really a big thing in the third trimester too so focusing on my sleep routine and I know you talked a lot about that with uh, Dr. Saunders um, but just really staying consistent and making sure that I am going to bed at a good time and when I am waking up in the wee hours of the morning I just get up and go with it and tell myself that I'm preparing for the baby I'm preparing for those moments um, and if I do nap, I, I nap without any guilt or anything in the afternoon and just remind myself that this is um, a new normal for me and things are gonna shift and productivity might not be <laughs> the best some days, but um, I think it really all starts with um, a good nighttime routine and really being mindful of electronics and blue lights and all those really important components of sleep and just making sure that when I'm sleeping, I am getting a good sleep. Um, what about you with a newborn? What does your sleep schedule look like? Honestly, you know, I've, I count um, ourselves lucky right now because our Eileen was born, this is baby Eileen, who is sleeping like a champ at the moment, was born January 7th. So she's 14 weeks old. So we were already in a hibernation mode before all of this hit. So um, for us, the first couple of weeks postpartum were you know, it was a little bit of a haze, but from the get-go, I'll say it very quietly, she was a pretty good sleeper. Um, and right now, what our routine looks like, and we're still trying to figure this out too. Um, my husband's a massage therapist, as you know, so he's completely off practice right now. And I'm seeing clients virtually. And right now I'm seeing clients kind of in the after work hours when I do have childcare. So mm -hmm. um, I am working a little bit into the evening. So that does look like eating a little bit later. And that looks like us watching Star Trek before we go to bed because we are giant dorks like that. Um, but we do have a little bit of a bedtime routine where we change a little girl. Um, we have a humidifier that blasts at like airplane lift off level. And the white noise is so, so critical. I find um, leading up to um, giving birth and afterwards because if you were sleeping really lightly I found like every time there was a noise in the house the furnace came on my husband was snoring the cat was coming up I would wake up and just wouldn't be able to go back to sleep and then when you have a newborn 
like every little gurgle or coo or she's at the phase where she's like sucking her whole fist would wake me up. So the really loud white noise, far louder than you would ever imagine to be healthy, works so, so, so well for us. So we have that going. I read a book. I'm really delving into the world of fiction right now. Um, I don't know about you, but I found that as soon as I was pregnant, I'm such an avid um, personal yeah. development, self-help, health, like improve your life, fix it all reader. I just couldn't. Like I just was not in the brain space to push, push, push. I was more in the phase of let me just marinate. Let me just feel this. Let me just experience this. And fiction, I find, is such a great way of really feeling and experiencing a lot without going very far because we can't go very far right now. So our evening, um, I read a book before bed. We've got really dim lighting in our bed. And I mentioned this on a previous interview. We adjusted all the lights in our house. house um, our overhead lights are what we call dim to warm. So they go from a really bright blue light to a more orangey red light, which helps to promote healthy melatonin um, production in the evening. So it helps to promote sleep, given that we might be waking up in one hour or six Ooh. hours from bedtime. <laughs> um, and then we're really conscious. She tends to wake up um, maybe once a night around three or four, sometimes later, and then six or seven. And I often we just stay in bed later because we can. Um, yeah. I'm really conscious of not getting up, um, not turning on all the lights, not looking at my phone in the middle of the night. Um, we often sing, I sing her back to sleep and we have this little routine of my cat coming up and I sing to her and the baby and my husband if he's up. And we really try to keep it very calm before bed. Um, mm -hmm. And one thing that I'm noticing for us during this phase is we can just kind of roll with it. I mean, if we have, if we're lucky enough, all of us privileged enough to have a house full of food and to have our basic bills being met right now, you know, everyone's struggling a little bit, but mm -hmm. that we don't have to push all the time that we can adapt our routine. It is a beautiful thing that you can nap. Yeah. Yeah. That you can go outside when you're ready that you can eat when, when it's doable and that you know maybe we get used to not having the full routine initially when you first had your baby that will come so that's what we're doing yeah that sounds great i like the tip about the white noise i'll have to get mine started i mean uh, you want a good dehumidifier ours also just started dying <laughs> so in the middle of the night it does this horrid like sickly die um and it's spooking our cat so you want a reliable source of white noise <laughs> <laughs> um, what about creating structure for, say, movement and meals um, right now, given that, one, you're probably a heck of a lot more tired and your daily structure is not <laughs> different? Yeah. Actually, I'm kind of enjoying, I, I'm not a big cook. I've never really enjoyed cooking. Um, but this has forced me to reevaluate that statement. Um, and I am actually enjoying having meals. Um, like cooking meals and then eating them right away. Normally I would do a big meal prep on Sunday and then kind of like reheat as needed throughout the week. So that has been a big shift and a welcome shift. I think one of the best things I did for myself when this whole kind of isolation started is I cleaned out my pantries with the intent to donate to our local food bank. Um, but that also allowed me to see what I have and what I didn't have and kind of make my meals from there. Um, so I find that we're, we're wasting a lot less um, food, which is great. Um, and we're eating more consistently. And also my husband and I are able to eat together, which we oh. previously hadn't really been doing. So that's nice too, because we are also newlyweds. So it's nice to have that time together um, right. with meals. Um, but in Ingersoll, it's not always easy to get into the grocery store or we're doing grocery pickup and sometimes, you know, they're a few days out booking. So I make sure that when I do get my groceries that I always get a source of fiber or lots of fresh vegetables. Mm -hmm. Um, if I know that I'm not able to get another grocery order, I just buy everything frozen, all my frozen vegetables and cook from there. 
And really the only thing that I'm craving throughout the pregnancy is carrot carrot oranges. So I always have a bag of those in my cart. <laughs> but that's that's what meals look like for us. And um, snacking is, you know, bound to happen throughout the day. So I just make sure that I have snacks that satisfy my cravings, but also, you know, provide some nutritional support. So having carrots cut up and having oranges and apples available to me to kind of make sure that I'm stacking on that, those kinds of foods as opposed to chips and candy and things like that. Right. One thing I was um, thinking about, I was in uh, Bulk Barn and our local Zayers yesterday, and this was the first time that I'd left the house. I mean, I go on regular daily walks and I go to the office once in a while to fill orders, but this was the first time that I was out into the world for close to a month. Um, my husband usually handles all of that. And it just struck me how strange it was. Um, there was a lineup at the checkout that was like Disney World length around the whole store. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I have to commend our local businesses. Everyone is just trying their best to adapt. And anybody that I ran into, I did run into because we were keeping a really nice social distance. Um, everyone was being very respectful. And then I went over to Bulk Barn um, to stock up on all of our fiber things. And yeah. it was just a really interesting experience of being walked around with um, the gentleman that worked there. He's like, how much of this brewer's yeast would you like? Um, brewer's yeast, because clearly um, all the lactation support is happening right now. Um, <laughs> how much of this would you like? How much of that? Um, and I was thinking like, maybe this kind of cuts down on the impulse purchases because yeah. Um, somebody is watching or we're in this mindset of like get in get out or if you have a giant shopping list and you're shopping for a few different families you're not perusing and touching and having that same sensory experience that we normally would it's like it's a mission yeah for sure I definitely feel that way <laughs> so we're getting some comments on uh, Facebook here we are answering questions live um, and I see that um, Eileen's grandmother is watching baby is behaving well right now um, and on that note, speaking of grandmothers, it's, it's an interesting time for grandparents. Um, my own mom, who's watching, has met baby girl twice, and she's 14 weeks old. Um, and we're doing a lot of video calls. We're doing a lot. Oh, sweetheart. We're doing a lot from a distance. And I think everyone's trying to adapt. Um, tell me how you're staying connected during this time when... Literally anything can happen. I'm going to mute myself just in case. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, I am, I'm from a fairly large family, so I'm one of seven, the youngest. Um, so a lot of my siblings, actually, I think, yeah, all of my siblings have babies, which my, my mom especially is very, very connected with, and they all live kind of in the Dublin area. Um, most of them do. So in terms of staying connected, I, I don't often see them, which is unfortunate, but my mom is getting much better at FaceTiming, so that's good, yeah. Um, and then my, my husband's um, mom, she lives also about an hour away from us too, and um, she's always been really great with FaceTiming too, and just making sure that we have everything that we need and lots of phone calls just to check in. Um, but it's, you know, there's no denying that it, it is very hard. It's very hard to um, kind of have that expectation that, you know, my entire family won't be able to meet my first baby born, you know, that's just, it's, it's a tough one to wrap your head around and, to really come to terms with but I think in virtual in the world of virtual communication everyone is trying their best to just check in and um, connect um, as often as needed and I find actually I'm FaceTiming with my nieces and nephews a whole lot more than I ever have before which is nice um, but yeah we all just try try to check in because I think everyone's having, you know, their own their own tough time with what's going on, and the the isolation is definitely hard to um, to deal with on on your own. So reaching out and having that virtual connection is pretty much how we're approaching that. You know, I think it's it's pretty cool too that I find myself I'm calling more and sending more yeah. updates now because we're not necessarily planning on those regular visits especially if you have family living at a little bit of a distance like you do and i do yeah 
Um, can you talk to me a little bit more about specifically emotional management right now? Like what, what you are doing? Because clearly a lot of us are experiencing that kind of intangible grief. Nobody passed yeah. away unless they did, and I'm sorry. But um, this grief over letting go of some of our expectations, like how are you handling things, oh. Christina? Yeah. It's funny, a grief for me especially represents so much more than just the passing of a, of a person or a pet or something physical, but you know, it's recognizing that grief every day looks different. And one of my naturopath, my personal naturopath that I go to, she told me something that really resonated and that was, you know, we have all of these emotions as humans and we have a tendency to label them as good or bad. When in reality, we just have emotions as humans. And the power of emotions comes when we allow ourselves to feel them fully and to experience them in our body. Um, and what we can sometimes do, especially in a grief situation, is we suppress emotions and we suppress feelings and we just kind of wish them away and don't deal with them. And then they sit and they fester. And for me, those thoughts and those emotions show up at like the 2 a.m., when you're awake and you can't get back to sleep. So I really focus on just letting my body feel these emotions and whatever way they come. Sometimes I cry third trimester. I find I cry a lot easier. <laughs> so I cry, I laugh. Um, affirmations are a big part of my, my routine too. So affirmation, just words or phrases that reframe and reshift my, my mental talk. Um, and I was actually talking to Fallon um, this morning about affirmations and just the power of the mind and making sure that we are still checking in with ourselves and still checking in with um, how we are talking to ourselves because so often um, what we say to ourselves is portrayed in how we treat ourselves and how we treat others. And um, I really focus on that. So affirmations, I journal a lot. If I get a lot of cyclical thoughts that, you know, I just can't break out of, or, you know, they're just not leaving me alone, essentially cyclical thoughts. Um, I journal them and I'm, I'm a very visual person. Um, and I just let that be a symbolic act of my thoughts leaving my head and they're staying in my journal and I shut the journal. Um, so I'm very, very visual with my mental health and I do a lot of um, active thought work, which is hard, but um, there's so many things that come with mental health too and supporting yourself through this time and something that I more recently started doing is just reaching out to a lot of my resources. So Keila, you've been a great help, you know, reaching out to Fallon, reaching out to a few other healthcare providers and just you know how I'm feeling and getting their opinion. I'm talking to women who have been through this birthing process before me and getting their reassurance because that is all you know helpful um, to to reshift my mind frame and make sure that I'm still um, feeling comfortable with the way things are going and dealing with the changes appropriately. Yeah. <laughs> We're all adjusting over here. <laughs> this is normally nap time over here. Um, uh, hi, baby. Yeah, I mean, he's so bright right now. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and on the other side, I mean, from a postpartum side, um, oh goodness, <laughs> I'll just keep muting myself if she fusses. Um, one resource that I found particularly useful through pregnancy, because as you know, I was managing a really full practice, trying to do training. Um, we have a number of family businesses, and there was a lot going on and renovating all the things. Um, yes. I would often wake up with my brain just on. And yeah. it's hard to go back to sleep and then be fully present the next day. And of course, all of that has shifted right now because it has to um, for a number of reasons. One book that I have always found really helpful is called Loving What Is by Byron Katie. And um, what I love about this book, when we have these thoughts, <laughs> when we have these thoughts is um, going through four simple questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sometimes this happens with the newborn. <laughs> um, we go through four simple questions of, like, is this thought true? 
am I just thinking it? Is this just my assumption? Is it actually true? Do I know it to be true? What else could this mean? And who would I be without this thought? And um, for those of you that are, I'm not so emotionally driven. I tend to be a little bit more logical and very much in my head. That's my mm -hmm. wiring. It can be really helpful to have like a, an order of operations to take ourselves through these thoughts and these feelings mm -hmm. and none of them are good or bad. It's just, um, it's often our, our thought about the thought that is more worrisome than actually what's happening. It's not yeah. that, you know, grandma can't see baby today. Of course she can, we can do a video chat, but what does that mean? And for some of us that might be bringing up, like, I feel isolated. I feel abandoned. I feel uncared for. I feel not acknowledged in this time. I'm feeling vulnerable. So it's not really about the grandma can't see baby today. It's maybe more of those other things. And I find having that structure is helpful to say like, you know, it's not about the not visit today, or it's mm -hmm. not about the other specific thing. Um, but I like what you're saying about having like that practice of a journal that you can just physically close. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, rest there. Um, so in terms of self-care, I mean, obviously as naturopathic doctors, one of the tools that you and I utilize is supplementation mm -hmm. and we're certainly not going to be giving, um, advice to anybody that we're not actively seeing right now, because that would be irresponsible, but <laughs> Um, I find one of the best defenses that I had was having a good supplementation regimen in place for me to help preserve my mental well-being, to make sure that I had the energy to address any concerns um, that were coming up and really, if I did nothing else, to make sure that my supplements were set up. I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> make sure that my supplements were set up um, a week in advance so that at the very least I knew I was getting the basics. What about you, Christina? Yeah, I, I actually, I saw your Instagram video and I, I do the same thing is that I have a little pill um, divider and I set them up. And for me too, I, I, you know, maybe it's our profession that we're just in this caregiver um, mindset, but it was really easy for me to ignore a lot of my symptoms and ignore kind of my own supplement routine. So that's where um, I actually, I did start working with my own naturopath and I came up with the supplement protocol specific for me to really help with um, a number of nutritional deficiencies that just came up out of pregnancy. And I, this is my first time being pregnant and it was, it was crazy to me that how quickly my resources depleted. Um, so in staying on top of my supplementation, I do feel a lot better, um, especially from a mental health perspective too, when you have the energy and, you know, I'm still out of breath <laughs> every once in a while, but um, just having the stamina to get through the day and complete tasks and not feeling totally drained and um, like brain fog is no longer an issue too, which is uh, nice, very, very nice. So supplements, um, I think when they're indicated and when they're dosed appropriately, they can make a world of difference for sure. And being consistent with them too. That's something that I, you know, I had supplements here and there, but I wasn't always consistent with them and just setting up a simplified regimen of, you know, I need this nutrient, I need this nutrient and taking them consistently throughout the day has helped a lot. Yeah. Um, And then I think we, we had kind of talked to about addressing telemedicine and what that's like as a practitioner and sharing our thoughts on that, which um, I think is really, really interesting. I'm a little bit more shy um, around anything virtual. You can see I'm getting beat red now just talking about it, but I think from the telemedicine perspective, um, there's still a lot of great things that we can offer um, as naturopathic doctors. Um, something that I, has helped me kind of transition into virtual care has just been acknowledging right off the bat that it can be a little bit awkward. There might be some tech hiccups and a lot of my patients are from more of a rural area. So we often deal with internet issues, which is, you know, just par for the course and 
making sure that we have backup resources to connect with um, each other is important for me. But um, as a patient, I still, um, I do a few virtual telemedicine appointments right now, obviously, it being my third trimester and looking for care. And um, I do still find them helpful if I can prepare for the appointments appropriately and make sure that I have like all my questions that I'd like answered and um, ask specific things. And I think, you know, knowing that there are limitations from a practitioner standpoint too helps, um, helps me better understand where people are coming from as a patient. So that, that's kind of my experience <laughs> with the virtual medicine. It has been a huge shift for me, but uh, a really interesting one, and I have to commend a lot of the businesses and a lot of um, the different resources for pivoting so quickly into an online space. Um, it's not easy to do, so if you are doing that yourself, um, know that there's a lot of people cheering you on because it takes courage. Yeah. And there's adjustments. We're calling help for daddy right now. Um, <laughs> I mean, from a virtual perspective, we'll see how long this lasts. Christina, you keep going. We're just going to call Daddy right now. This is life. So I, I had some, um, I had some questions to my my personal Instagram page, um, um, specifically around new moms who have just gotten pregnant during the pandemic, and just kind of looking for some general advice. And I, I want to first acknowledge that, you know, congratulations, this is a still a very exciting time um, for you and for your pregnancy. And there's many, many women who have waited a long time to, to become pregnant. And, you know, it just so happens that it's during a pandemic. And I want to stress that our current climate doesn't take away that excitement of being pregnant. This is still a good thing. This is still a joyous thing. And there's still room to feel excited about this amidst all of the, the stress and the uncertainty as to what's going on. Um, and, you know, the first trimester, totally different experience than the third trimester. I know in my my first trimester, I was very, very sick um, with morning sickness that seemed to last all day. Um, and it just represents a few different challenges. And I would just say to give yourself grace in that period. And, you know, it's hard if you're at morning sickness. So I would encourage you to eat what, what you can and not associate any negative feelings or guilt around um, your diet if you're struggling with um, with pregnancy related nausea. And yeah, you've got to just let that go and just, it just doesn't feel good. Yeah. You just got to, you got to nourish yourself. And, Whatever that looks like for you, that looks like, um, that's great. Awesome. So that would be my, my biggest advice is to new moms is just to still recognize that this is a wonderful thing and a beautiful thing. Um, and this, there is still support out there for you, even if it doesn't feel like it right now, reach out to your healthcare providers and care just looks a little bit different right now. That's, that's the biggest thing. It just does. You know, um, when you say that, I'm reminded of a client that I had a, a week or two ago who had just found it, out that she was pregnant and uh, working in healthcare. She was um, very reluctant to tell anybody that she was pregnant and very reluctant to share with her family because of this generalized state of anxiety. And we had this really great heart to heart where I said, you know, it's okay to be excited. It's okay to be excited about life and hopeful towards the future. I mean, I think people when you are pregnant, it's not just about you. It's, it becomes a whole family event and that family event's gonna look different right now. But I think um, the more that we can bring joy and really hang on to what is exciting, hang on to what is uh, good in the world, it's better for everybody. And we, we needn't feel um, shame about sharing good news just because we're pickled in bad news and fear right now. Yeah. Um, and another bonus and <laughs> amongst crying baby and daddy rescue. So thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure if you've touched on Christina, but um, it is such a, a beautiful thing right now that we do have this time. I mean, for those of us that are at home, we do have this time 
um, to meal prep, we do have this time to fill the freezer with extra food. Um, and my best advice is make all the lactation cookies, make all the energy bites, make all the cabbage rolls and extra soups that you possibly can right now because you have the time. And in those first couple of weeks, it's such a godsend to have that food. And even if you're not able to see friends, um, to look at the brand new baby the way that uh, you would have hoped. Porch pickups are great. We've been doing tons of those, getting and receiving lately. And it's, it's so nice to get that text or that message like, hey, check your mailbox, check your front porch. I just left some chili for you. Yeah, so awesome. it is so good. And if you have any expectant mums in your life, send them food. They are, they are <laughs> cocooned and happy cocooned, hopefully, but still needing care and support from the outside world. And food is always so <laughs> appreciated. So appreciated. Yeah. So appreciated. Um, is there anything else um, coming up for you, Christina? You've done such a really great articulate job at um, sharing from your perspective. Um, I think too, something that I really focused on during this time in terms of mental support and emotional support is just, you know, I do have like a number of things that I have to do for my business and preparing for a mat leave. You know, we're also in a century home that we've been renovating nonstop just like you. Um, <laughs> and preparing for the baby and all that kind of stuff. And um, it gets overwhelming. So I made the decision a few weeks ago to commit to doing one, one thing every day that I want to do right now. That looks like, you know, going out for walks, maybe a little bit more often. I grab my dog and we just go, um, or working in the greenhouse and just doing one small thing a day that brings me joy. That is unrelated to my workload, mm -hmm. unrelated to things that are stressing me out. Um, and just making time for myself, even if it's only like five, 10 minutes. That's something that has been really, really good and a shift in perspective too, because we do have this luxury of time right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, as strange it is, as it is, um, and I've chatted about this um, recently with another client. We're getting all these pregnant clients coming in right now. Um, and I feel like it's partially because people have more time to think about their well-being. Just because we are at home, if we are at home, um, doesn't mean that the irritable bowel syndrome goes away. Doesn't mean that the PMS goes away. Doesn't mean that the desire for a first or second or fifth child goes away. If anything, it's more our concerns, our, our dreams are more heightened because we have so much more downtime to think about it. And um, where was I going with this? Um, we yeah. were talking about like, time and managing. Yeah, we have we have this more more time to to think about what it is uh, that we want for ourselves. And um, during pregnancy, we've chatted about this before, but our brain kind of goes into this more um, left brain place where we are more instinctually driven, where we are more. Um, responsive to things where we are just more within our body versus in our heads. So mm -hmm. we, um, it's nice to have that downtime to really think and really feel and really experience stuff versus go, go, go. And you know me, I worked like right up to like 39 weeks pregnant, host, you know, hosted Christmases and then bam, have a baby and then downtime. And it's really nice if you are in the final phases of pregnancy or early pregnancy when you have that soul sucking fatigue. And I know there's a couple, oh, it's so bad. <laughs> oh, I know there's a couple like newly pregnant uh, women watching right now. This, oh, is the time. <laughs> this is the time to really nap without guilt yes. as much as you can if you don't need to be somewhere at 8 a.m. Yeah. So um, there is that embrace this time. This is um, time to focus and enjoy. Oh, thank goodness daddy came to rescue. <laughs> <laughs> um, to really focus and count our blessings because yes, the world might be in a really crazy reactive place right now, but um, it doesn't mean that everything is awful. It means that we can really count our blessings and it can be helpful even if we are feeling particularly anxious to then name our thoughts to say, mm -hmm. I am feeling anxious because this, and this is what it means. I am feeling fearful because this, and this is what it means. And to get that out on paper, much like you do, and then yeah. close that book 
and also to detail what our blessings are. I am grateful that I had time to finish my cup of tea in my case because coffee is not happening in our house with our baby girl. Um, I am thankful that um, we were able to stay up a little bit later and connect because we didn't have to get up as early. I am thankful that we had beautiful weather in March to plant our garden and get a head start on our pea crop. Mm. Um, nice. Because none of this would have happened if, yeah. um, if we were going and busting at 10 hour clinic days or yeah. whatever that looks like in your life. Yeah, it's definitely been, it's been a shift, but there are some positives that have come from it for sure. Amazing. Christina, thank you so much for your time today. Um, if people want to connect with you and follow you because you are um, you really have a talent for women's health, for um, prenatal care as well, um, you and I share that passion. Where can people find you? I am on Facebook and Instagram. Um, my handles are just Christina DeCroon, naturopathic doctor on Facebook, and then Christina DeCroon underscore ND on Instagram. Amazing. Fantastic. Uh, so, you know, you and I are all about lifestyle measurements and things that you can do in your own life to take control of your health, to take charge of it and figure it the heck out. Um, so this whole Let's Figure It Out series is brought to you by my new 10 day free video course called From Fine to Fab. And it's 10 minute videos or less for 10 days, things that are incredibly practical and tangible that do not involve supplementation to um, help elevate one's health at all phases of life. But it's very much uh, women's health centric. So I'm gonna be posting links for that uh, in our recording as well as in the Facebook replay. And I would encourage anyone at home to sign up, join it. I'm not selling anything. I just want to get a, um, offer some value in this world right now um, when many of us are just trying to struggle um, and achieve a new way of functioning. So sign up for that. Make sure you follow Dr. Christina. Um, we will be monitoring the comments uh, for any questions and happy to answer things uh, there, not of a clinical nature. But thank you so much for your time today, Christina. Thank you for everyone that is watching live and on the replay. It is a pleasure to have you and to serve and stay posted for future episodes coming out weekly. Great. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure, Christina. We'll talk to you soon. Talk soon.